Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Obviously, today a little bit different. I'm giving you a Friday show. I was traveling yesterday with my family, and this morning I woke up, and I was like, out of the goodness of my heart, due to the overwhelming level of professionalism just in my body, I gotta fill these beautiful bastards in one more time before the weekend. Also, is this a little bit connected to me trying to hide from my children after traveling with them for 14 hours yesterday? Two little boys who love to antagonize each other, running on no sleep, so it's like just being around little drunk people. We'll never fully know, but with that said, Buckle up, hit that like button, otherwise we'll punch you in the throat, and let's just jump into it. And then, it appears that the Will Smith, Chris Rock, Oscar slap situation has reached its conclusion. Because today, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences announced that they are banning Will Smith for 10 years. For those 10 years, he can't return to the Oscars or attend any other Academy events, though he will retain his Oscar, and he remains eligible for future Oscar nominations and wins. And so with this, to keep it short and sweet, I wanna pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts around this ban? Do you think it's a good move? Too little, too much? What are you thinking and why? Let me know in those comments. And then, don't burden the chip. Children. And you might take that in a metaphorical sense, but I mean, literally, do not burn the children. And I'm having to say that today because of the science teacher at Granbury Middle School in Texas. Or essentially a teacher saying, hey, wanna see something cool after they finished a test early? With the teacher deciding to show the kids a science experiment that maybe you've done yourself in school, where you put hand sanitizer on your hands, you light it on fire. It can be a fun party trick. The first time I ever drank, someone did it with Bacardi 151. Which, really quick, as a disclaimer, I am definitely not recommending you try this. But you know, the teacher did, and for most of the students, it worked, as you can see in the video. Except for this one 12-year-old student who reportedly panicked and the whole experiment went terribly wrong, leaving his hands with possible third degree burns that I, I can't show you on YouTube and sending him to the hospital. Following this, a teacher resigned, local police are investigating the case saying they'll turn it over to the district attorney for review when they're done. With a general reaction from most parents being, why would you literally play with fire? This is why for centuries people have said, don't play with fire. But also you have others defending the teacher saying, the teacher may not have made the best choice by doing this experiment, but it obviously went perfectly safely 99 out of 100 times. I don't think them losing their job is the solution. But I will say I do have doubts on the validity of an argument of, hey, they only burnt one out of 100 children, y'all. Like, I'm not going to a restaurant if there's a 1% chance that there's glass in my food. It's because the main point of this story is, don't be stupid, stupid. And then, let's talk about Gen Z and Piper Sandler's taking stock with Teen Survey that came out this week. Right, because when we talk about the difference between generations, it's important to look at the younger ones to see the cultural shifts. In this survey in particular, you use 7,000 teens across 44 states, the average age being 16.2 years old. And some of the unsurprising news in tech and entertainment, you had teens citing Netflix and YouTube as their top sources for daily video consumption, both platforms tying at 30%, with Hulu clocking in light years behind at 8%. Then in terms of social media, TikTok was the most popular platform at 33%, followed by Snapchat at 31%, and Instagram at 22%. And while it might sound unsurprising to you to see TikTok up at that number one spot, this is actually the first time that TikTok has edged out Snapchat for that spot. Then when it comes to futuristic tech advancement, teens aren't fully sold on all of them. Right, you have over a quarter saying they do have a VR device, but the vast majority of them do not use it daily. And then almost half of teens say they're either unsure or not interested in the metaverse. Also, as we've been talking about for years, the line between celebrity and influencer has blurred. Because even though there were separate lists for each, there was definitely some overlap with certain celebrities counting as influencers. And regarding that, you had Emma Chamberlain taking that top influencer spot, beating sort of the mainstream stars like Kanye, The Rock, Zendaya, and then you had Jadeon closing out the list. And very notably, the report mentions that figures like Kylie Jenner, David Dobrik, and Charlie D'Amelio fell out of the top 10. And David's fall is especially notable because he was actually the number one influencer just two years ago. And if you just look at his main YouTube channel, he's still pulling five to seven million views on his regular videos. Which leads me to believe this is in some sort of situation where an influencer is like falling off, but rather their audience is growing up with them and they're not picking up young people at the same rate as they were. Also, while I want to mention that these surveys usually talk about celebrities and influencers and entertainment, the report also looked at social causes of interest for the group and found that Ukraine invasion took the number one spot, followed by the environment, racial equality, gas prices, and inflation. But ultimately, I do want to pass the question off to you, whether you're Gen Z, a millennial, or whatever, what are your thoughts regarding this survey? And then, one of the biggest things that happened while I was out yesterday, Ketanji Brown Jackson officially became the first black woman ever appointed to the Supreme Court after being confirmed by the Senate. The final vote was 53 to 47, with three Republicans joining all Democrats in this historic confirmation. With those three votes not unexpected, Senator Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, and Mitt Romney of Utah crossing the party line. With the vote succeeding, you see Mitt Romney applauding the confirmation while his Republican colleagues leave. And of course, with this, we saw Democrats cheering the move as a major step. Representative Ayanna Presley tweeting, watch your step, concrete ceiling just shattered. Others noting how important her confirmation is for representation, like New York Attorney General Letitia James, who wrote, 
Today, history was made. As the first black woman confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson is an inspiration to millions, including black girls who will finally see themselves represented on America's highest court. But on the other side, we saw Republicans continuing their effort to paint Jackson as a radical judge whose appointment is all part of Biden and the Democrats' far left agenda. And if you're wondering why on such a sure vote, Republicans would just continue hitting on this situation, trying to make KBJ sound like a baby eater. It's all about the midterms, baby. With it maybe being most obvious with Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell saying in remarks on the Senate floor before the vote, the far left got the reckless inflationary spending they wanted. The far left has gotten the insecure border they wanted. And today, the far left will get the Supreme Court justice they wanted. And it makes sense that Republicans are using this strategy. Back in 2016, when it was Trump versus Clinton, while well, obviously there were a number of things happening, there was a big aspect of the next person gets to nominate a Supreme Court justice. And obviously over the last four years, we've seen what a massive impact that has had. I mean, this is, it's generation changing. Right now, if you look at polls, Democrats are far less motivated about the midterms than Republicans. It's seeming very likely unless Democrats can get a fire lit under their bases ass that Republicans are going to retake Congress. And that's incredibly notable, yes, in general, but also for the next two years of Biden's presidency. Because in an interview last night, Mitch McConnell would not pledge to consider a nominee to fill a Supreme Court opening in the final two years of Biden's term, which also should not be surprising. When Obama was president, he nominated Merrick Garland after Scalia died, there were still 11 months of his term left. So same shit, different day. From that, I want to take a quick second to thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, Vessi. Vessies are lightweight shoes that are even perfect for the winter because they actually keep your feet warm and dry through rain, snow, and mud. That's to say, they're built for everyday life. I'm constantly in Vessies running errands, playing in the yard with the kids, and I love their weekend Chelsea boot that I can dress up for business or for date night with Lens. And with their revolutionary technology, Vessi makes a truly versatile shoe that is 100% waterproof and snowproof without sacrificing comfort, breathability, or style. The perfect shoe for hikes in LA and on my winter vacations. And how does Vessi accomplish all of this? They make their shoes with Dymatex material, a dual climate knit, keeping you cool in the summer and warm in the winter, and with antibacterial insoles, they're always fresh. They're always coming out with new designs and colorways, so head on over to Vessi.com slash DeFranco right now, and be sure to use code DeFranco for $25 off. Grab a pair now while they still have your size, and you'll be thanking me later. And then, we've got the massive news that Canada is building a border wall around their housing market, with Canada taking a drastic step in curbing soaring home prices yesterday after their finance minister proposed a budget that included provisions banning foreigners from buying homes for two years. And on top of that, the country plans to spend billions in an attempt to encourage new buildings for Canadian buyers. And this is huge because if you don't know, Canada is one of the most expensive housing markets in the world. And since February of 2020, home prices have skyrocketed by 50% on average. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's government is already worried about backlash from soaring prices, but coupled with inflation, there are real fears among his party that they could see serious losses if opposition parties are viewed as offering more to handle the crisis. Now, that said, this is coming from the government, so of course there are loopholes in the rules. Right, it won't apply to foreign students, workers, or permanent residents. Which is probably why Finance Minister Freeland has other proposals in her budget. Where beyond largely banning foreigners from buying homes, the government also plans to introduce legislation that would allow Canadians under 40 to save as much as 40,000 Canadian dollars or a down payment through certain tax exemptions. And it's possible that with this move, Trudeau will also make good on his promise in last year's election to ban blind bidding, which has been very controversial. Which, if you don't know, is the practice that keeps the bid of potential buyers secret, which ultimately encourages them to bid as high as possible, leading to home selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars over asking. But even if he doesn't do this, the backlash towards blind bidding has been so great that the Canadian Real Estate Association announced that it would start a pilot program that would show bids in real time, kind of like an auction site online. And overall, while the proposed ban on foreigners is likely to prove popular among Canadians, there are concerns that it places outsized blame on certain groups of people. With people like Simeon Papaelius, founder of the real estate investment firm Rec Canada, saying, I don't think prices are going to fall as a result, though I do think it takes away at least some of the competition in what is the most competitive market in Canadian housing history. And adding, I don't think a two-year band-aid is going to have an impact on what's a fundamental lack of supply. Which is probably part of the reason why you have some saying that there needs to be a cap on how many properties one can buy as they're being used more as a speculative asset rather than a home. So with all that said, of course, I want to know everyone's opinion, but especially for the Canadians watching, right? I'm an outsider talking about this, looking in, you're living it. What are your thoughts here? Border wall or no border wall? What a polarizing way to stage that question. Then in international bullshit news, not in that it doesn't matter, but that it's infuriating. Let's talk about Mohammed Bonesaw. Granted, some call him the Saudi crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, but real ones know Mohammed Bonesaw is his real name. Right, he's the guy who totally didn't have Jamal Khashoggi killed, dismembered, and disappeared. Despite known intelligence saying Mohammed Bonesaw did have Jamal Khashoggi killed, dismembered, and disappeared. Right, it's been over three years since the Washington Post columnist and critic of the crown Prince was murdered and the trial of 26 men who killed him is still ongoing. Which I will say that trial was already infuriating enough because you could just see these people as fall guys for Mohammed Bonesaw. But now in a just outrageous update it appears that MBS is trying to suppress that trial. And to give you some background here if you don't remember, following the CIA report that concluded that MBS did in fact order the murder, in 2020 Turkey opened a trial of 20 Saudi nationals including two former top aides of the Crown Prince, with six more people being added to the trial later that year. But now the 
court handling the case just ruled that the whole thing will be suspended and transferred over to Saudi authorities instead. This is like if I was charged with a crime and in addition to being the defendant, I was the prosecution and judge. But you're putting this super sensitive trial in the hands of the Saudi government that is the one guilty for murdering the very person at the center of the case. Also the same government that carried out a mass execution last month of 81 people whom state television said followed the footsteps of Satan. Well, there's all these bullshit reasons being thrown out by Turkey right now as far as like why this is justified. Many believe this is part of Turkey's recent effort to normalize relations with the Saudi kingdom, which deteriorated after Khashoggi's killing. A move that Human Rights Watch called a scandalous decision, Amnesty International saying it is cowardly, it is spineless, it is a denial of justice, which I imagine Bonesaw said justice, never heard of her. Would we definitely not kill her in one of our embassies as well? You know, ultimately, that is the way of the world. Mohammed Bonesaw is getting away with murder. And he's getting away with it because he has the two most important things in the world, power and money. That sounds incredibly shitty, but that doesn't stop it from being true. And then finally today, let's talk about major updates to the war in Ukraine as we head into the weekend. First off, today Ukrainian officials said Russia launched a missile strike on people trying to escape at a train station in the eastern city of Kramatorsk, killing at least 50 people and injuring nearly 100 at the time of recording. Ukrainian President Zelensky accusing Russia of cynically destroying the civilian population and added, this is an evil that has no limits. We had the Russian Defense Ministry denying any responsibility for the strike and instead saying the accusations were a provocation and implying that Kyiv was somehow responsible. Though obviously that's fucking insane and beyond that. We've seen reports that a fragment of the missile found near the train station had the words for the children inscribed inside it in Russian. The attack also comes as officials in eastern Ukraine said today that Russian forces have ramped up their shelling of the region as part of what they described as preparations for a full-fledged assault that could occur in days. And to that point, according to reports, Russian troops are currently being repositioned in the south and east, with Russian forces having largely retreated from the northern parts of Ukraine, including the outskirts of Kyiv, with the regional governor of the Sumy region in northeastern Ukraine saying that the area is now fully back under Ukrainian control, but warning that it is littered with Russian landmines. So with this, all eyes are currently on the south and east, with officials preparing by opening 10 humanitarian corridors today to connect towns in the region to safer, more central areas. And there's a lot of anticipation in regards to what happens next, especially after some incredibly unusual comments Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov said to Sky News yesterday. In what's been described as the first broadcast interview with Western media, he also gave the first indication that the Kremlin sees an end for this war, saying, our military is doing their best to bring an end to that operation which operation is a cute word for the ruthless slaughter of civilians, but he did also add, we do hope that in the coming days, in the foreseeable future, this operation will reach its goals or will finish it by the negotiations between Russian and Ukrainian delegation. And very notably here, Peskov additionally admitted, we have significant losses of troops and it's a huge tragedy for us, which is a rare acknowledgement of Russian losses and his remarks about the war potentially ending sooner are incredibly huge. And they also come as Russia continues to face increased pressure from the West. I mean, just today, the European Union formally approved its fifth round of sanctions since the war began, issuing a ban on coal imports and imposing sanctions on high-profile Russians and two of Putin's daughters. That also coming a day after Congress passed two bipartisan bills to suspend trade relations with Russia and block oil imports from the country. And while those pieces of legislation largely mirror actions already taken by Biden, they still provide some new elements and are symbolically very important. Which on the note of important symbolic moves, yesterday we saw the UN General Assembly voting to suspend Russia from the organization's leading human rights body, a move the Associated Press described as a rare if not unprecedented rebuke against one of the five veto-wielding members of the UN Security Council. But ultimately that is where we are right now and there's still the question in the air of when will this end? What can stop this pointless and unneeded suffering? But ultimately, that is where that story and today's show ends. Thank you for watching. I love yo faces. Click right there if you want some more news, and I'll see you next time.